So we've got about uh, half an hour or so to get through some questions, and I'm hoping to get some uh, fairly uh, lively discussion out of our esteemed panel today. We'll also try to get a few questions from the audience as well. Uh, uh, for my panelists, I do reserve the right to use the dog clicker if they're droning on just a little bit. And that's nothing personal, <laughs> except maybe for, for Michael Nielsen. Uh, <laughs> So that's kind of how the, how the game is going to work today uh, from our panel. On my far right here, we have uh, Michael Nielsen, and we have uh, Robin Hansen, who just spoke, and uh, Gary Wolf, who spoke earlier this morning. So I, I want to open things up um, immediately and say that Michael and, and Gary had talked about what's loosely called citizen science, where kind of the average guy in the street can join Galaxy Zoo or make some comments on a, on a math blog and, and participate in science. And my question to Robin is, is this a fad? Is this a, 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 a coming strength in science? Is this a force in science? Or will we uh, see this fade away? It will probably continue and increase somewhat. I don't think it's going to suddenly basically change everything and displace everything. As most of you probably know, uh, you know, 300 years ago, uh, we had a lot more amateur science. And uh, that was because the professionals weren't very well there wasn't a big institution for funding professionals, but now we've got huge institutions out there willing to fund professionals. Um, that would be, anybody just disagree? I mean, the only thing I think uh, that I would add to that is um, the border between, science is more than what scientists do. Uh, you could look at something, in some ways that's completely obvious. Science gets consumed, for instance. So if there's, um, more consumption of science, say people are trying to access online academic journals, then maybe um, there's a way to, uh, those journals perhaps become richer in some way, and therefore maybe there is more need for articles to fill them, and there you have perhaps just a classic sort of relationship between people who are not scientists but consumers of science and science in general, or the field of science, the context of science. And, this is what I think is happening with the quantified self. You have people who are, in a sense, consumers of science, but they're finding ways to access science and participate in science in ways that were much more difficult before. And, and perhaps one more thing, which is that many scientists are actually consumers of science, too. And as soon as they leave their own terrain of specialized knowledge, they themselves need to access these same publicly accessible resources. Maybe a way to frame the question is that to say that there's an arms race among all the different organizations out there that would like to attract amateurs to help them. <laughs> and uh, the new technologies we've seen in the last decade have dramatically improved the ability of many different kinds of organizations to attract amateurs, including scientists. Uh, scientists have succeeded in attracting some of them partially, but how long, you know, is there a general advantage they have, or is that just a temporary advantage that once one website is up, they gain, and then later on they lose? Well, let me ask Michael. Um, I know you mentioned that um the wiki sciences, loosely speaking, have not done very well online. And part of that is that people just need to write their papers and they have other priorities. Uh, is it possible to get, you know, that funding could be directly directed to people who add to wiki science pages? And can we change the, um, the motivations for scientists to get some of this jump started? I mean, certainly we can. In fact, I mean, a reasonable fraction of, of the uh, yeah, that, that's how some of the, the, the wiki pages that, that, that have come up have, have come about is, is very directed programs. Um, I guess the NCBI uh, at the NIH is, is, is a good example of the, the kind of organization that, that does this kind of thing. But it doesn't spread, so you're left with a very small group of people uh, who, you know, the, the, the standard pattern is to be very excited at first, to run around giving lots of talks explaining how this is wonderful, uh, and then to get disillusioned as nobody else comes along and, and picks it up. Um, so, you know, it's good to start that way, but it, it hasn't sort of had this, this viral uptake like Wikipedia had, for example. I think it's illusory. I mean, often people ask, well, there's this problem with science. Let's get the funding agencies to fix it. And you have to understand they're part of a system. <laughs> they have their agenda. They, they have their incentives, just like the scientists have their incentives. They're not some external force who can do anything you want. Can, um, I, can, I, can I give an example where the, the funding agencies did make a huge difference, which is the, the sharing of, uh, of human genome data? So basically, up until about the mid-90s, it was very unclear whether or not people would actually share uh, genetic data or not. And then there was a, a big meeting in Bermuda, and later followed up by other meetings, where basically the world's leading biologists got together and decided, yeah, we are actually going to share 
human genome data. It's going to become a condition of getting your grants that you agree that you're going to share it within 24 hours of getting the data. And this just totally changed everything. And part of the, the way you can see it's changed th things really dramatically is that there are other life forms which this is not true, uh, and, and, and we don't understand those uh, nearly as well in part as, uh, as a consequence. So Perhaps I think that's the NIH an example. NIH open yeah. access policy is also yeah. another example. Um, NIH funded studies now uh, uh, going forward have to publish their, the scientists have to publish their results in a form that is eventually uh, open access, and, and that's, that's very important. So we've been talking a little bit about who would do science, as in should citizens and the guy in the street be doing science, should scientists be doing science? And you know, we're here talking about the singularity, and are we much better off just dedicating all of our resources to creating AI and leave, a, you know, leave science to AI and really not worry about it? I mean, you, you, you're assuming that we've kind of got a fixed, uh, a, a fixed bag here, right? So there's a whole bunch of people who are scientists who can't contribute to the creation of AI. They don't have the skill set. So what, what should they, you know, what should they do? Uh, retrain, perhaps. Not <laughs> <laughs> an economist, a former physicist, now economist. Uh, maybe you can go back to uh, directly fighting for the singularity. Not many people want to go to a university with famous robots yet. <laughs> Is, is that day coming? <laughs> when there are famous robots, then maybe people will. Well, Until then. Well, let's just say Car <laughs> Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon has a, a well-known robotics program, and the, the human leading their robotics program is very well-known and attracts a lot of people. And as they work with DARPA, I mean, their, their robots are becoming famous. So isn't that happening now? It's, it's also the impressiveness. So as I said, my working hypothesis is that people want to affiliate with impressive academics, and that drives the entire academic process, including which schools people affiliate choose to go to. So you'll have to make these robots uh, impressive enough that people will want to have that as one of their primary affiliations. I went to, to, with this robot. <laughs> We're ways off from that, right? Gary, any, any thoughts here? Well, just that... Um, there is a, um, there's some low hanging fruit here. And while we're waiting for the singularity, we may want to learn something. And um, if we do want to learn some things, doing science is a good way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you one question. In, in, in your talk, you talked, you, you mentioned, I think it was automated psychiatric classification, okay? And this idea of my words are predicting whether or not I'm, I'm suicidal. Are we ready for that information? So are we ready for a bot that's going to search through all of my tweets and all my Facebook postings and tell me stuff about myself that I may not want to know? Yeah, I mean, this is, um, I think it's probably wise to get ready. And I think um, the way these things work, in my observation, and, and you know, perhaps Robin can comment if, he's, if he has some thoughts on this, I don't think that, um, that uh, attempting to evaluate our, our moral or psychological readiness for technological advance ends up counting for a lot in the end. In fact, if there's benefits to us, some people will do it. And if those benefits are real, other people will imitate them. And I think that's what we're seeing in the quantified self. If you look at who comes, who's there, it's, it's quite a, a narrow sort of pioneer phenomenon, but these are people who are tech people, scientists themselves, kind of cutting edge people who are deciding, look, there's something in it for me here. Um, and, you know, if that proves to be true, because maybe the jury's still out in some ways, if that proves to be true, other people come too, ready or not. Um, when is, since again, this is the, the Singularity Conference, at what time will an AI start to make its own hypotheses and run its own experiments? And, and when will they start, start to take over science? I mean, we're seeing, uh, there was some research done at Cornell recently where uh, programs are given sets of data in physics, and the program is deriving the some of the natural laws of physics, conservation of momentum. It's figuring out on its own. And uh, there's a, a program in Cambridge now with uh, named Adam, and I guess it is essentially a roboticized scientist. It makes its own hypotheses, does experiments, and, uh, and makes conclusions, admittedly early stages, but is this 
uh, going to take over science rapidly, or is this just an aberration in a in a very narrow domain? Uh, my I mean, uh, I think you know, this kind of thing is, in some sense, quite common. Um, any experiment which has feedback control loops, which are digitally controlled, um, you know, that that's. I mean, and, and you know, there are uh, millions of these, well, millions is too many, but thousands of experiments like this around the world. And, and people, they, they keep you know, increasing the intelligence of the, the way they do the feedback control. Um, you, know, you, you just talk to, to, to a scientist in the lab and, and they'll tell you how they're, they're doing that. And there's, it's, it's a continuum, right? They're going to start out with pretty dumb algorithms and, and gradually they, they make them smarter and smarter, simply for purely selfish reasons. They want to do better experiments. But yeah, so I think it's happening. Wrong? Uh, there were celebrated uh, software examples like that back when I was a young student, long ago. <laughs> if you recall, Pat Langley uh, and a variety of other people had things. I mean, obviously academics have heard about computers. Uh, they uh, use them a lot. They do add value. They do add to productivity. Uh, what you have in mind is, what? Well, yeah, but what about the big highbrow intellectual part? And obviously they're not very good at that now and haven't been for a while and won't be for another while still. Uh, how while <laughs> is, not, is, is not a while? 50 years? 30 years? 100 years? I mean, so that, that's, uh, if you look at trends, if you just say, well, how better have they gotten over the last four decades of my experience, um, you wouldn't project a very fast rate over the next four decades, uh, but there might be game changers. And also, I think it's worth looking at the human machine collaboration, because this is really where the action is. And, um, you know, it's, 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 um, it's easier to imagine machine-independent science than it is to implement it, obviously. But where humans can connect with machines, make themselves interpretable in machines, for instance, you have tremendous research project that, pro progress that I think is on the verge of happening. If you just look at something simple like, um, well, uh, I meant to bring this up in my talk. Ed Boyden gave a talk yesterday about control of neurons using light. And um, he, afterwards we were talking and he said that um, he brings his students at MIT to conversations with clinicians on a regular basis to try to understand what's the need, or what's the desire, what's their wish list. And very high on their wish list, he said, is ways to monitor the phenotypic effects of interventions. Because this is very hard. Even the basics are really hard. Um, and there we're making huge progress. So that's a piece of the feedback loop that's been missing. And so I think there are, there are many other cases like this, you know, in cosmology, um, you know, which, which we've seen, or many others, where it's the human-machine relationship where the payoff is very, very real and very present. And, and a quick question. As we've all got uh, iPhones and iPods, and to your point in your talk, we are learning much more about ourselves, and we're integrating, and, you know, I tracked my sleep last night through my iPhone app uh, nights, and I know I got six and a half hours of sleep. Is, is it actually kind of turning me into more of a robot? I mean, you're, hopes, I'm understanding yeah. my system. I'm, am I losing some of my humanity? Well, I, I didn't, go ahead. And that's I called a, civilization. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a good answer. I mean, we built our humanity with technology, with the words and literacy and learning to reflect on ourselves by treating ourselves as a book you know, and, and thinking of our consciousness as a stream of words, these are all sort of innovations and things that we had to practice and evolve, and, and now we're using numbers in a much more intelligent way. Uh, Robin, economics question for you. The cost to, uh, uh, to discover new drugs, so Big Pharma now paying upwards of 800 million for discovery of a single drug. The tools have been getting better and better. We've seen lots of graphs at this conference. Why are the costs of discovering a new drug not dropping right now? Why do they continue to increase? Uh, we have a regulatory structure that is not very flexible and not very willing to consider other mechanisms for approving. Um, once it's a very sensitive subject, uh, it's a very difficult political coalition to put together to produce a regulatory structure that people will accept for approving drugs. Uh, that happened many decades ago, and nobody's been allowed to touch it since. And it uh, doesn't look like these things are likely to have the political force to upset that balance either. Try to recruit human subjects and start counting the costs. Right. Well, let me ask Michael, and related to that, obviously human subjects, very expensive, reluctant to take some drugs. Uh, 
if we had an AI that could sort of mimic the human body and brain and how everything works, so we could test drugs in an AI, would the AI sign up for drug testing for humans? So why would, okay you, why would you mimic the, uh, the, the brain if, if the effect is on the body there? Well, if, if you wanted to test drugs, human drugs, like an anti-depression drug, for example, and you didn't know the, the circuits and pathways of the human brain, so if you've got an AI that's close enough to a human being or can simulate a human being, would the AI be okay with testing drugs? Would it, would it be okay? I, I, I'm not sure. I'd have to ask it. Um, uh, 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 yeah. I'm going to click you on that one. That's, that's, okay, that's, that's, <laughs> it, it seems, I think you, you blinked a couple of times. It's enough of an answer. <laughs> it, it's, it sounds like, kind of like asking, you know, could we invent jet airplanes? Because that would be a better way to test propeller airplanes. <laughs> Maybe we could get more efficient tests of propeller airplanes if we only had some jet airplanes in the test, level, test suite over there. I mean, fair point. Uh, Gary, you had mentioned that there were people doing, I think it was uh, taxonomy, by sending in samples to a central lab, which was then doing some, some sequencing and get, getting some information back. Is science headed towards a world where everything is centralized, where there's, there's one wet lab for chemistry, and when you want to do an experiment, you send off your order to that lab, so we start outsourcing the, the grunt work, or will it always be plenty of cheap grad students for two dollars an hour. No, I work. think this gets to Robin's point about de-skilling. I mean, this is taxonomic skill. I mean, this is a scientific skill that takes people decades. And in fact, there was a beetle guy who's uh, now uh, a lamented, a late lamented beetle guy, uh, Dr. Roth, and now people can't get their beetles identified. I mean, this was a, a lifelong expertise, and this is what's being de-skilled. And that just, that, that you could call that centralization, but of course there's also decentralization associated with that, which means that some guy out in the field can know what his beetle is. So if he's counting beetles and he's trying to determine if they're a signature of some kind of environmental change, he can now do it without um, giving up and changing careers, which used to be sort of what happened to you when you couldn't get your beetles identified. Um, wait, can, I, can I just interject? I mean, when you have very sort of capital intensive, uh, 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 very standardized procedures, that's the kind of thing that, that cries out for centralized facilities. So we see that in genome sequencing, for example. To, to, some, ex, to some extent, we've seen that. There are countervailing uh, forces as well. But there are a lot of things uh, which are not at all. Basically, I think standardization is the key issue there. When you have uh, uh, things that are very not standard, where, where they're very contingent upon the way uh, you know, a particular co collaboration turns out, there aren't going to be centralized facilities. Um, well, let me answer a collaboration question then, which is, uh, one thought was, could we centralize the generation of the hypotheses? So could you have one person sort of directing groups all around the world saying, you should work on this, you should work on that, so that we don't duplicate work, so a better coordination of science projects. Is that happening now? Is that coming? Or is that too, <clears throat> too centralized and I mean, off-putting? J j just to sort of answer what I take to be sort of the prior question, I, I mean, I don't think that would be a good idea, um, uh, just in terms of uh, you, you're, not, you're not taking advantage of all the knowledge in the system. Um, uh, it's much better to, to try and take as, as much advantage of people's different ideas as, as, as possible. The question you ask is often more important than the process you go through to get the answer. Um, okay. But Robin, are we, are we duplicating? Are people in China working on experiments that we're working on in the United States and we're just wasting our time? You want to be careful about creating central coordination to solve a problem which may make it worse. But nevertheless, I'm sure there are many ways we fail to coordinate in academia, and we're not really very interested in fixing them. <laughs> so is, is there any way that we can change the system and the priorities so that there you is know, more coordination? If, if somebody in China, you know, is redundantly doing something else to somebody in Britain, uh, but they both seem impressive, uh, the system works. <laughs> Well, I'll just throw this to Michael because I think you should talk a little about open publication, the publication in the form of notes, exposing notebooks, because just at least in the small, in the provincial world of like, are you going to be late to the game and spend a couple of years working on something that somebody else is doing better, maybe there is some, some progress, but you should talk about, about uh, that. I mean, to, just to, to come to this mathematical collaboration that I, that I talked about, you know, if you're working on the same problem elsewhere in the world, what, what do you do? Um, do you, you know, keep the fact that you're working on it secret and hope that all these you know, extremely good mathematicians fail. are going to fail? 
do you throw your lot in? I mean, th they were actually very polite when they set up and they, they tried to make sure that that wasn't going to happen and, and whatnot. But, but you know, certainly in future projects, that's not necessarily going to be the case. So to some extent, this is potentially actually a mechanism for solving uh, some of the coordination problems. If it's widely known, if it's publicly known that you're working on these problems, you're taking a real risk if you, if you then want to go off and work on it on, on, on your own. Um, and just to bring something else to the table that Ed Boyne and I talked about, like peer review does occur. It just doesn't, it, the real peer review occurs before the fake peer review that occurs when you submit the paper <laughs> to the journal. The peer review occurs when you're working with your graduate students, when you're talking to the people you trust and asking them if you're embarrassing yourself or making a mistake. That all happens. It's just not exposed and formalized. And then the formal peer review comes in after the fact as a kind of waste of people's time. Uh, who they complain about it a lot, and, and Ed was saying that, I mean, they've got amazing results in their lab. He says so, some stuff they don't even bother submitting to a journal. It's sort of like they're on to the next thing. They publish it, if they share it, they put it in, you know, and now they're working on m less formal modes of publication. Um, and they're in a very, they're at media labs, so they've got funding sources that are somewhat unconventional, although, you know, that's been imitated. So there are, I think, ch changes that are occurring, at least at the very practical level, that are helpful for scientists in terms of collaborating, coordinating, and sharing results. Okay, well, I, I do want to give the audience uh, five minutes to ask some questions, so let's uh, start, apparently start over there. <laughs> Thanks. Is that good? Oh, there we go. Thanks, I particularly enjoyed, you asked the question, what is an expert? And um, Given if you are able to know who the experts are, do you think it's important to survey those experts to know what, especially in controversial fields like the study of mind, what are the best theories of consciousness? And if you could survey those experts, do you think that would be important? And also, do you think it, in addition to surveying those experts, do you think it would also be important to survey non-ivory tower people, just the general population, and be able to compare and contrast those consensus to each other, but do you think that would be important and, and would that be possible? So in general, academia neglects consolidation in favor of adding more uh, discoveries. Uh, so that's sort of a general thing people have lamented all over the place. So doing surveys of people to see what they think is a kind of consolidation. It's a kind of way of trying to summarize uh, what people have figured out after uh, working on the frontier for a while. Uh, and it's the sort of thing academia neglects because, uh, again, uh, you don't help people affiliate with impressive people by uh, giving a survey. Over here? Yeah. Um. So there, there's a lot of talk today already about like collaborative networks and how uh, they can assist experts or, um, or they can let, allow experts to tap into amateurs um, and also about how we currently identify experts. Um, but what do you guys think about collaborative networks helping us identify who the experts are to begin with? Is that something you see happening? Michael? I mean, you, you sort of do that all the time, right, unconsciously. Um, you know, when you, you already, you, know, you, you look at a YouTube uh, 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 video, you make a, a choice about whether or not the person seems like they know whether or not they're talking about, whether or not they know what they're talking about. If you think that they do, you reshare it maybe to some friends. That's an example. Well, it, it seems like institutions now, they're, they're the ones that basically decide who's getting the resources. It'd be, uh, does anyone see collaborative networks being the ones that decide who's getting the resources? I'm not sure what the distinction is between between collaborative networks and institutions. Like, you know, you're drawing a hard and fast distinction between two things that are very, very close to one another. Well, maybe make a concrete example. Imagine somebody writes great blog posts, but doesn't have many academic articles. Uh, will they get? And then they want to submit to get grant funding. Uh, they'll have trouble. Right. Right. <laughs> right. So the right. collaborative process by which blog readers and other blog authors are telling people that this is a good blog author doesn't much intersect with the other more formal processes that uh, decide who gets funding because uh, they require, you know, more formal. All right, let's try uh, one more question over here. Hi, um, <clears throat> thank you for all your, all your insights. We, everybody here, most of the people here, most of the people up there are adults, and most of the people we're talking about are adults, graduate students, academics, and all this. But the people who are most comfortable with the new machine uh, human interfaces and the, and, and the sharing and all this stuff are the young people, are the kids. And my question is, how can we do more to take not 
graduate students, but K-12 to kids who have these capabilities who are really interested in this and bring them into the picture so that when they grow up, we won't have these problems. Well, I, I would only say that um, I think a side effect of the um, perhaps softened psychologically pernicious ramp up of competition, academic competition, and its scale down uh, in, in age to younger and younger age uh, may have a positive side effect of um, driving people to explore technologies of learning and knowledge sharing. And I actually have seen that on a very micro scale. Um, it's, it's already competitive and um, there are tools that will make you smarter. And so that, that has a natural effect of advancing these tools. Okay, we have time for one more question. Yes. Yes, thanks. I have a question for Gary as well. Um, Gary, you talked about uh, live logging, having Kelly quantify itself. We really love it. Uh, if you extend this view towards DNA, DNA sequencing, uh, profiling, what is your vision on the future of live logging and DNA profiles? Will, yeah. will we share it? Yes, I think we will, but DNA, and this is a real top, hot topic in our group because a lot of people have done some genotyping, feel very sort of, um, it, 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 there's not a lot there. You do it almost as, a, as, as benefacting the pool of knowledge because uh, you don't learn a lot right now from, from, from having parts of your genome sequenced. I don't know anyone who's done the GNOME full genome sequence yet, but the key there is as phenotypic tracking. So I do think that as the genotyping becomes more common, it will be extremely important to have a database of phenotypes and be able to see the behaviors um, and the, the physiological changes that people undergo and to correlate them with, uh, with the genome. I think that's pretty, it's quite hard. So we'll see where we get. Uh, Robin or Michael, do you want to add into that? No. Nothing? So. Okay, well, thank you guys so much, and uh, thanks to the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Testing.